Hello, and are we going? I think we're going. <laughs> I heard music. Hi, <laughs> and uh, welcome back to our third Thursday uh, Vet Chat, where we give you uh, a chance to chat with individuals uh, who served uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, I'm Mike Thornton. I'm the curator here at the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Vietnam Era Museum. Uh, just a couple housekeeping notes. As always, this is a webinar. And while we encourage you to ask questions, we have disabled the chat feature uh, for our own sanity. And so um, if you do um, want to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature if you're here in Zoom, or if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, you can use um, the, uh, hang on, let me look at my notes here. Uh, you can post in the comments there on the Facebook Live. Um, so tonight, uh, between the years 1966 and 1972, an estimated 300 to 600 civilian volunteers served with the Army Special Services. 75% of them were women. And in honor of Women's History Month, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Army Special Services librarian, Ann Kelsey. Hi, Ann, welcome to Vet Chat. Hi, Mike. Nice to be here. <laughs> I'm excited. And I um, tell me, <laughs> how did this all happen? Before you ended up in Vietnam, where were you growing up um, and where were you born? Uh, I was born in Kokomo, Indiana, <laughs> but I only stayed there for six months. <laughs> however, how, however, my both my parents had been born and raised there. And that's where they returned after World War II ended. Um, but right after I was born, my father was offered a job uh, as a civilian doing what he had done in the Navy during the war, which was build missiles. Oh. <laughs> um, and so we moved back to Washington, D.C. And he worked in this program uh, under the Bureau of Standards until the Navy took it over. Um, and then we were transferred to Southern California, uh, where he went to work at the Naval Ordnance Lab. Oh. And so I, that, I was five then, so I really grew up in Southern California. Uh -huh. Well, you, you would have grown up, when did you enter uh, into the, without getting into actually going to Vietnam, what years were you in high school? I was in high school from 1961 to 64. I graduated from high school in 1964. Uh, okay. So, I mean, I always ask uh, participants on this program, to what extent were they aware of the global situation going on in Vietnam uh, prior to finding themselves front and center? Absolutely not. <laughs> Didn't even know what, what or where Vietnam was. Yeah. Well, how, did your, was high how did your path there begin? Um, well, I went to the University of California, Riverside for my undergraduate. That's, that's where I, I lived in Riverside. So I went to four years to that University of California campus. And I majored, I have a dual bachelor's in anthropology and English. Mm -hmm. Anthropology because I was absolutely fascinated by it and English because my parents were appalled that I was Majoring in something so useless. So to <laughs> pacify them, I to, to pacify them, I double majored in English, which they thought would be more appropriate for someone who was going to be a librarian. <laughs> uh, so that was where I first started learning about Asia, because I had a professor, uh, an anthropology professor, who had done his PhD research with the boat people in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. In Hong wow. Kong Harbor. And so that was when I first started to learn about Asia, Southeast Asia, 
And I took as many courses as, as they had from the cultures of that part of the world. And so I already, I had an interest in Asia anyway, even without anything to do with Vietnam specifically. So I got my my bachelor's degree and then I went to the library school for my master's at UCLA. And of course, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, while you were at UCLA, this would have been probably like 1960, 65, 66? 68. 68, well, so, (laughs) Tell us a little bit about the tenor of the anti-war movement on campus at that time. Yeah, well, at UCR, things were fairly mellow, even though I was there from 64 to 68. I graduated in 68. But it was mellow for a number of reasons. One, River, there was a very large strategic air command base Uh in Riverside, March Air Force Base right outside of Riverside. So I grew up with Air Force brats and with kids just like, whose parents, just like my dad, worked for the military and as civilians. So, you know, we, we, I grew up with everything stopping in the morning when the jets took off and broke the sound barrier. Um, <laughs> Every, everybody, you know, the, the kids whose parents were in the Air Force, the, it was the Cold War. The dad, their dads were on alert. Yeah. You know, they, they went through alert cycles. Um, so I, you know, I just really grew up in that kind of an environment where everybody, we were, every, you know, dads went TDY, uh, temporary duty, you know, all different places and so that was the environment I grew up in when I and the apartment I lived in uh, in Riverside when I was going to college you know there were lots of Air Force guys living in the same apartment complex with the college students so anti-war activity was very subdued at UC Riverside because there there was just a strong affinity to the military there. What, oh, did you so, did you think about joining the service at all? Never. I never thought about that. No. Um, but then I went to UCLA, and that was a whole different can of work. <laughs> And of course, I went to you. I went to you. Started going to UCLA a month after Robert Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles. Um, when I was uh, in summer school, that was when the the Democratic Convention in Chicago was, you know, just in a in a riot situation. So it, it was, it was, there was major upheaval everywhere. It was sort of like, and actually my friends and I talked about it, the end of days, were we going to have a future? Not a lot unlike it is right now. Um, and so um, the anti-war movement at UCLA was huge. Uh, the Students for a Democratic Society were lined up all over campus. And if they could identify a vet, they went after them. Mm-hmm. And by 68, there were a lot of guys who had been to Vietnam, come back, been discharged, and were going to college. So, as well as, of course, the ROTC component. So. Anytime they could identify an ROTC or a vet, you know, they were right on them in very hostile manner. And I, that, I, had, I had many friends who were either in Vietnam or they were in the Air Force flying over it or maintaining planes in Thailand. 
um, and uh, guys who would come back. And I, I was just, I just couldn't stand it. <laughs> it, it, just, it. I was just so upset about how these guys were being treated. And then in the spring of 1969, um, special, our special services recruiters came to the library school. Oh. And they were looking for librarians for the entire Army Library Program, which was a worldwide program. Anywhere where there's an Army base, there's an Army Library. So they weren't specifically recruiting for Vietnam. They were, you know, they had positions in the States, in Germany, in Japan, Korea. So, but when I found out that there was a library program in Vietnam, I said, sign me up. Huh. I filled out the forms and I was going to go to work for the government anyway. I mean, I the, the the if you work for the federal government as a librarian with a master's degree, you went in at a fairly high GS level, huh. which meant you actually got a living wage. Yeah, imagine if, that. <laughs> yes, if you if if you were working if you were working in a public library at that time. You would probably make five thousand dollars a year if you started as a GS nine with the Fed, at least nine thousand, maybe ten thousand. Wow! So yes, major difference. I took a five thousand dollar pay cut when I left the army and went to work for a public library when I came home. So certainly the you know the salary. So I had a job lined up with naval undersea warfare in. San Diego doing cataloging. Huh. And then this opportunity opened up. So I shed us in that and filled out all the application forms to go to Vietnam. Was there um, was there competition for those positions in Vietnam? No. No, not at all. Certainly what nobody did, else I was going to school with was interested. <laughs> what did your what did your parents, especially your father being a veteran, what did he um you said your father was not a veteran, but he had what did what did no, your he parents was, think? He was, no, he was a veteran. Was. He was in the Navy. Yeah. Ah. Um, what did they think about all that? Well, they had just finished getting my brother, who had graduated from high school the same year I graduated from UCR, 68, and had no interest, zero interest in going to college. So they had just gotten him into the National Guard, which at that time was a safe space. Uh -huh. well, some National Guard, a few National Guard units were activated to go to Vietnam, but they were very few. Yeah. Same with the reserves. If you were in the reserves or the National Guard, your chances of going to Vietnam were very low. Yeah. So they had gotten him a slot in the California National Guard, and he was going to be going to basic training, and they were like wiping their brow. And then I came home and said, I'm going to Vietnam. <laughs> they, were, they were not happy. <laughs> not at all. They were appalled. <laughs> <laughs> well, what type of um, what type of preparation did you do? Did the army offer you any? So you're going to Vietnam. This is what you need to know. Um, what was the preparation um, like? After I saw the recruiters at UCLA, I did not see another person associated with special services until I was in Saigon. Huh. They sent me, actually, I just pulled them out for an interview with a PhD student. So I got three, three little pamphlets. One had to do just general uh, civilian personnel office type information. One was from special services, but it was directed to the service clubs. That, those are the rec centers. 
um, that had more more women worked in service clubs than the libraries. Mm -hmm. And okay. then the third one was the little red booklet that I that everybody got. The the guys, the soldiers all got them. It was a it was a government publication. It was very small and had a oh. picture of a Vietnamese. I'm sure you've seen it. Yes, Vietnamese the one with the Vietnamese girl. In and yes. uh, right. Okay. So the, I got those three. The, of course, I did. I knew about Southeast Asia because I'd taken classes. But you know that certainly not everybody was in that position. So that was it. Then I received uniforms by mail, hmm. and um, and I received the paperwork to get a passport because I had to travel on a passport. And I got a list of the inoculations that I needed to get. And they told me to that I there was a military installation near me that I had paperwork that would allow me to go there to get my uniforms tailored and my shots. Uh -huh. So I went to March Air Force Base, went to the base tailor, got the uniforms tailored, and went to that base hospital, got all my shots, and then I got travel orders <laughs> and plane tickets in the mail and got on got on a plane and off I went. <laughs> well, I, I have to ask, I um, we're this the summer exhibition, late spring, early summer exhibition here is, is going to be about how people got to and from Vietnam. And I'm curious, what uh, did you fly a civilian chartered uh, airline yes. over there? Yes. Do you remember what airline? Yes, it was Brana. I still uh -huh. have my boarding. I still have my luggage tagged in my boarding pass. Oh, you, maybe we can borrow them for the show. <laughs> Actually, you might already have them in the traveling truck. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, you know, it's a, there's that always that moment between when you say you're going to do something in that moment before you actually do it. And then plane is usually a good place to think about what is it I'm about to do? What did you think on the flight over to Vietnam? What was going through your head? Well, <laughs> I mean, I was excited. Of course, I was the I, I flew from Southern California to San Francisco, and then I took a bus from San Francisco to Travis Air Force Base, and then I was in this giant hangar with all these guys. I was the only woman, and the flight left in the middle of the night. I you know I I remember it being in the middle of the night, and. I was the only woman on board except for the flight attendant with all these guys in this uniform, yeah. straight skirt, suit jacket, hose, pumps, gloves, hat, you know, that's um, 24 hours on the on those planes uh, until I got to Tonsonut. I remember they said us a lot. There seemed to be a lot of there seemed to be a lot of meals. Oh and, huh. <laughs> and I'm I don't know. I just was excited. Well, tell me about first impressions of Vietnam when you arrived. Yeah, first impression, yeah. Well, we got Tonsonu in it was it was daylight. So must have been mid morning, something like that. And um, they opened the door, and of course the heat. Everybody remembers the heat. Now I grew up in the Southern California desert, so I was used to hundred degrees plus temperatures, but not to the humidity. Uh -huh. So we, you know, we've been flying for twenty four hours plus, and um everybody gets off the plane all of the military gets scooped up and shoved off to buses they're traveling on travel orders not passports 
me and a couple of male civilian contractors, we went through immigration, Vietnamese immigration, Vietnamese customs. They looked at our baggage. So I end up out on the sidewalk, me, my suitcases, and I'm like looking around and I have no idea what to do next because I don't know anybody there. Yeah. Nobody gave me a name of anybody there. <laughs> and of course, no phone number, but that hardly mattered because there were no phones. <laughs> and nobody speaks English. And I don't speak Vietnamese. And a Jeep with a couple of GIs pulls up at the curb and says, are you with special services? That was the one time when the uniform was beneficial. And ah. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and so they loaded me and my bags in the trunk, in the, in the Jeep, and hauled me off to the service club. And Charmaine, the woman who was running the service club, she called the library people and told them that there was a librarian there for them to pick up. <laughs> and they never knew when anyone was coming. No one told them when somebody was coming. So fascinating. I wonder why. Huh. Hmm. So uh, were you stationed in Saigon for, um, actually, for two first, let, first let me ask you, how many, how many library, I mean, do you know how many branch, how many libraries were in Vietnam? At actual the, libraries, there yeah. were, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Over the course of the war, there were probably anywhere from eight to 12. Okay. And did you spend your entire time at one or did you travel around? Or? Oh, I, I, I did it all. <laughs> if for two months, I was in charge of one library in downtown Saigon. Oh. Um, and then they were opening a library in Chulai of the America. And mm. the librarian who was at Cameron Bay <clears throat> was going to go to Chulai to open that library. So mm. they needed someone to replace her at Cameron. And I volunteered. <laughs> um, and so I. So I went to Cameron Bay, and there I was in charge of four libraries. Oh, wow. Huh. The Cam Cameron, uh, Cameron Army Library, uh, the Con Six Convalescent Center Library that was also on Cameron Peninsula, the 18th Engineer Brigade Library at Dong Batin, which was just across the bay, and the library at Camp McDermott in the Trang, which was about 25 miles up the road. Huh. Well, so Cameron is such a place of, there's so much activity going on there. People, a lot of people coming and going, a lot of people permanently stationed in, in that neck of the woods. What would, who are your, <laughs> I, I'm trying to imagine these, these rough and tumble American GIs in Vietnam visiting a library. What, what were your customers like? <laughs> Tell me about your well, Patreon. And what did, what did they want? What were they looking for in the library? The, at, the, at the Cameron Army Library, which was the biggest one, they were mostly from transportation units. Hmm. <clears throat> you know, there was a sea land dock and, you know, a, Cameron, a lot of material and equipment came into Cameron. So there were transportation units there because they ran all of this stuff on convoys up into the Central Highlands, to Bamatuit, a lot. And um, so the nature of their work, like with all convoy work, is you are in a very dangerous situation while you're driving on the road. And then you come back and then you are just kind of hanging out until you're ready to load up and 
do another drive. So they had time on their hands. Yeah. And a lot of them were going to school. Huh. There was a there was an uh, Armed Forces Institute operation there at Cameron, right next to the library, uh, so they could sign up correspondence courses with the University of Michigan or the University of Maryland. Both ran college level correspondence courses. And so they came to do their homework. I had a lot of guys in there doing homework. Huh. And I did what I did at the community college in New Jersey. <laughs> you know, <laughs> answered their reference questions, helped them with their homework, got them books they needed to write their papers. Um, and um, the other thing about the libraries was they were air conditioned. Oh. Not for, not for the humans, but for the books. Aha, uh -huh, of course. Because in that, in that climate, if, you, if, they, if, they, if the books were not in an air conditioned facility, they would mildew immediately. Yeah. yeah. We had lights in our closets if we put clothes in a closet because of mildew. Oh. So, um, so it, the library was a popular place just to come in. And it was, it was a place where the enlisted men could come in and get cool. There was no other air conditioned facility. You know, the recreation centers were air conditioned. The other special services, the craft shop, uh, they weren't air conditioned, but the libraries were. So for that reason, they you know they could just come in and sit and read a newspaper, look at a magazine, and um, and just cool off for a while. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. we had a I, there was a lot of traffic. Uh, the kinds of things they they read, they liked they liked books uh, to help them learn how to use all this fancy electronic equipment they were buying from the PX. Ah. You know, the cameras, the cameras and the tape recorders and and that kind of thing. So they uh, some of them were interested enough that they were going to R and R on R and R and they were interested in where they were going. No. They would come in to get some information about where they had decided to go. Although a lot of them went to Hawaii to meet their wives, yeah. um, and um, and just general nonfiction reading. They, but especially the magazines and the newspapers. We had current magazines and newspapers. There was no censorship. In the I, I was going to ask you: Was there any attempt to no. shield the, them the from the outside world? No. The woman who was in charge of the library program had started it up in 1962 working for the Navy and then transferred to the Army in 66 when the Army took over the morale and recreation operation. Oh. And she was, she was adamant that there would be no censorship of reading material. And there oh. was not. Yeah. There's been some of, I've heard so many different things from our veteran volunteers here. You know, some of them had access, you know, some of them even got to watch news programs every now and again and some you know they're just so far out there on their patrols and their operations yeah. that you know never a chance but that was i am nothing. i was curious you know, one thing that you um i know that, that in addition to the libraries that there were also these uh craft and photography uh yes. studios yep. did you work with those at all i well i <laughs> i i I knew that the the people who ran who ran the craft shop, uh, um, and I I would occasionally go in the craft shop. The the dark rooms were the big thing. Um, huh. There were dark rooms, even if there wasn't a, a actual craft shop, there were dark rooms all over. And on the top of Nui Baden and near Tainan, there was a dark room. And, huh. the, and the craft people then would chopper and fly all around resupplying those dark rooms. And that was a big part of their job. 
but one funny anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> there was this there was this soldier in the craft shop at Cameron, and he was diligently working on this belt he was making. <laughs> and he was engraving something, you know, he was do wood, he was tool working leather, and he was very carefully engraving something into it. So we're kind of watching what he does over it. And finally he finishes it and he's very proud of it. And he holds it up and it says FTA. Yes. I will, I will leave it to you. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and then I mean, there that... was also entertainment. There was well, a sure. whole entertainment group. Special Services Entertainment that escorted the USO shows and also created their own programming, plays, bands, and soldier shows with, with soldiers and civilians and traveled all around the country with those. Yeah. In fact, they, they produced a play in the Cameron Library. Oh, huh. Huh. Well, I I, uh, I ask about the craft shops and that, uh, you know, in re in recent years, there's been a great deal of uh, both civilian services and and army services or armed services services that um, that use art as a way of helping veterans uh, and even those currently in the service to cope with uh, injury and PTSD. Yeah. And I was wondering, did you observe? was there like a cathartic element to those visits to the library or to those craft shops where people trying to, were soldiers and service personnel trying to process their experience and sort of express what they had gone through or was it more fun like FTA type craft projects? Not, not, not in, the, in the craft shops or the library so much, but yes, in the, in the rec centers and the service clubs. Hmm. If, if you if you talk to the Red Cross, the Donut Dolly, yeah. or 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 the uh, the special services women who work in the service clubs, uh, yes, and also the women who worked in the USO clubs, yeah, um, yes, because that that was much more of a one on one conversational situation. And, and, and yes, there were some, they, guys would come in and tell some harrowing stories. I mean, it, it was, um, and, and of course their job was to listen and, you know, try to, not to confront them or, or talk, but just to let them talk. Well, um, I'm going to certainly open it up to the audience uh, for any questions here, and Anne and I will uh, will keep talking. Um, and you know, there's no safe place in Vietnam, and certainly the bases were frequent targets for attack. Um, did you ever come under a fire? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, rockets and mortars. Rockets and mortars. Can you share yeah. us an, an anecdote or a story? Oh, the the. The worst one was when they blew up the ammo dump, and that actually wasn't rockets and mortars; that was sappers. And where was um, that? Cameron Bay. Okay. They they came across the bay and um, with satchel charges, which is the '60s equivalent of an IED, mm -hmm. and got into the ammo dump and blew it up. And that's why I don't have anything to do with fireworks. Hmm. That was uh, really scary. Really were scary. You, where you were uh, in your quarters, were you were you able to get to a bunker in time, or did you have access uh, to flak jackets or helmets? Uh, well, yes, I scrounged my own helmet. Huh. I had. Uh, uh, we were not issued any protective gear huh. at all. Um, Low, units that women were assigned to, some of them would issue them protective gear depending on where they were. But I was not. 
I scrounged a combat helmet and I had no flak jacket. Uh, we were, some women were issued dog tags. I was not. Hmm. Um, I had a Geneva Convention card that, that gave my equivalent military rank should I be captured. In English, of course, not too useful. Um, so, so no, in that particular night, I, it happened so fast and there was no way I was running out and, you know, 300 feet to the bunker. I rolled out of bed and pulled the mattress on top of me. <laughs> Which is what they did for the, in the hospital. They would put the guys on the floor and put the mattresses over them. So, and then, then there were, then there were the uh, rocket and mortar attacks. But right before I went to Cameron, again, sappers attacked uh, the convalescent center. Hmm. And when, when, when soldiers went into a war, these were mostly malaria patients and tropical diseases, they were all gonna go back to the field, but they had to surrender their weapons. They couldn't have their weapons with them when they were on the ward. And they came in again in the middle of the night and attacked the ward and killed a few. Um, they they actually in, infiltrated the ward itself? Oh yes, my. Yes, yes. Terrifying. Yeah. When it just happened right before I got there and they, the doctors were showing me the bullet holes in the, in the doorways. They hadn't even had time to repair it. Yeah. So you never knew, you know, it was just hanging, kind of hanging over you. You, you didn't think about it. Yeah. Then there was the time that the bullet went back by my ear while I was standing in the middle of my trailer. Yeah, Tell well, that was not the Viet Cong. <laughs> that was somebody who was firing his weapon and not paying attention what direction he was firing it in <laughs> for unknown reasons. <laughs> and that it just came right, you know, right through the wall of the trailer and then right by my ear and out the wall behind me. So I, I went out, you know, I don't ever remember being scared during any of this. I just, I went out, I dug the bullet out of the sand and I took it down to the commanding general at Cameron Support Command and said, you know, you got to tell these guys, you know, don't shoot towards the trailer court. <laughs> I should have kept that bullet. That would have been a yeah. I was great I was going to ask. I was like, uh, I did not. I left air. it on his desk and stalked out. <laughs> great gravy, huh? You no, know, what's your? You mentioned a trailer. Talk to me about you know what on earth. I'm imagining like a a building with bookshelves and stuff. But your um, the library was it was it a, a mobile trailer like an airstream type? type deal or oh no the trailer was where i live okay oh huh i i happened to be home at lunch or probably oh. to use the bathroom because there were no bathrooms anywhere on the post for women mm. nowhere <laughs> not no. not for nurse personnel or american red cross or uh well there were no nurses on the army side but no <laughs> Huh. No, no bathrooms would. Wow. And so were, were all the civilian, so I were the civilian personnel all in one area or was it all just the women civilian personnel in one area? In terms of working or living? Uh, living, living. Okay, living, it, it varied at Cameron, there was the trailer court had all of the women who were working on the army side and the field grade officers. <laughs> so that's in one trailer court, the women in front and the field grade officers in the back. Um, and that, so that was Red Cross, Donut Dollies and social workers. 
um, special services. At that time, there was no USO there. Um, there was a, I roomed with a, an army WAC. Oh. Uh, oh. Who, who was doing something with supplies. And then an Australian civilian woman who worked for the PX. Oh, huh. For the United States PX. Yes, yes. Dang. That's right. Huh. And. Well, the, grouping. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, um, you know, so the opportunities to interact with our free world allies, um, some some vets had a lot of chances to do that. Others, you know, absolutely not at all. What uh, I'm just, if one could go back in time and eavesdrop in on your conversations, what were uh, what were the things that you that you mutually all kind of discussed in your free time? We didn't. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't talk about anything. anything. We, it, it, we all we all had our jobs. They were all very different jobs and we focused on our jobs and did very little socializing. I did socialize some with the other special services woman who worked for entertainment. We became became pretty good friends. But I didn't know what a donut dolly was until the 1990s. I uh, knew these yeah. women I knew these women worked for the Red Cross because I they had the Red Cross on their uniform. I knew what the social workers did, the women who, because they had an office near the library. They were the ones who did the compassionate leave. Uh, you know, if, if somebody had a baby, they were the ones who were informed. If somebody died, they helped the person get a compassionate leave to go home. Uh, I knew them, but the donut dollies, I had no idea what these women were doing. I know they came in the library and they asked me all of these really strange reference questions, which now I know was they were developing their programs to go out and play games on the fire bases. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know what they did. We never talked to each other. Huh. Well, that, that's so surprising to me. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but I would, I would no, think. No, I'm yeah. surprised too. Hmm. I'm surprised too. You would think that so few women, you know, in that kind of a situation that, that, that everyone would really bond together. Yeah. Yeah. But at least in, at least in my experience, that was not the case. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, who, you know, everyone, you know, the guys in the front have their foxhole buddies, who was your library buddy? Was there was there anyone you could kind of? Did you write home at all about what you were doing? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah, I wrote home. I don't know that I was very specific about what was going on, but yes, I did. I did. I did write home. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, I worked alone. Yeah, and. Uh, as did the woman who were who worked with entertainment and the woman in the craft shop. We all worked alone. Hmm. The, the, the service clubs had they had more personnel. There were usually two, maybe three women assigned to a to a club. Uh, but with the libraries, the crafts, and the entertainment, that was not the case. Yeah. We, huh. we really, we were really on our own and we, we had to manage our facilities and we, it was just us. Hmm. Hmm. Did you have any um, free time to go out and interact with the, the Vietnamese or the local cuisine and the culture? Um, did you do that often? Did you feel safe doing that? Um, tell us a little bit. Yeah. That. Um, no, no, I interact, I had several Vietnamese employees. The libraries were staffed by local nationals. Each uh -huh. library had one soldier assigned to it. 
and then all of the other employees were local nationals. Uh -huh. uh, and so I supervised, you know, and and they and they were all women in my in my case. There were there were three in the Cameron Library and one each in the other three libraries that were mm -hmm. much smaller. And in Saigon, there were like seven huh. Vietnamese women. Um, with very were they were they them. being were they being paid for that for yeah. that work? Yeah, it were Vietnamese civil servants. Civil servants, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, they these were local national employees. Yeah. Just like you have a local national employee in Germany. Um, that's true right now. That's how they staff facilities. Yeah. Um, uh, so some of them spoke, spoke very good English. Some of them spoke no English at all. Some of them spoke some French. I spoke some French. So we would communicate in French. Um, and they didn't speak. They spoke only Vietnamese and I spoke only English. We did a lot of hand signals. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was, it was a challenge to, to supervise all these people. So I did interact with, with them. Um, some of them did invite me to their homes. I didn't go. Uh, one, because I didn't think it was safe and two I didn't want to get dysentery yeah <laughs> um so uh in Saigon when I was in Saigon I did eat on the economy some but not a lot yeah. but in Cameron I I there I that was as far as Vietnamese culture I didn't, I, I, there was no sightseeing, nothing. It wasn't safe. You couldn't, you know, I could, what I saw, I saw from the air, like the Trang Buddha. I have pictures of the Trang Buddha that I took from a helicopter. Um, so I didn't, I didn't actually get to see Vietnam until I went back in the 90s. Wow. <laughs> huh. Well, I, um, just a, a little follow-up question on what you were just describing with the the civil employees. Um, it's not fair to probably put put words in their mouth, but it, since you got to interact with them a lot more than than a lot of our other guests on this program have thus far, the you know the U.S. brought a lot of money into Vietnam with the war, and but the inflation, you know, some I've read some estimates that it it bumped up the currency about 170%. Do you oh, think yeah. was, uh, was your perception that it was, did they feel positive about that work? Like, were they, were they happy for those jobs? Was it, was it more of, you know, what was sort of the tenor or your perception of that? No, they were happy to have the job. Yeah, they for sure were. Um, mm -hmm. The two women who worked in the Cameron Library uh, had kids who were with their parents in the lot. Huh. Um, and the woman in the Natrang Library, she her whole family was you know, was there. They had they had left North Vietnam when the uh, the when the Geneva Convention occurred and they were Catholic and they left North Vietnam when they drew those lines that separated the country. So, um, so her, hus her husband was in the army and, and she had kids at home. Yeah. And um, uh, the, other, the other two women, they also had relatives that were in in the South Vietnamese army um, and yes they were um, they were they were glad to have the job oh, 
Huh. Well, you know, there's uh, the guys always talk about how few United States or Australian or for lack of a better word, white and <laughs> white women, round, round eyes. eyes, yes. <laughs> um, talk, did you receive, you know, positive or negative? Did you, what was it like being one of so few women uh, in Vietnam? Was it a positive attention? <laughs> was it negative attention? Um, a mix? I didn't, it, well, I didn't have, I didn't have any issues myself personally. But I know many women who did have issues, um, ranging. My issues were involved, my job, it involved some military special services who just thought they could put anything over on this old 95 pound 23 year old and found out they couldn't. And, and, uh, and so that that was more of a hostile work environment situation <laughs> that I dealt with the entire time I was there. Um, but I I I was I acted like a librarian. I was a professional, and that was how I dealt with the guys that came in the library, and and that was reciprocated. And I was very careful about socializing. I, I mean, I just, I just understood that, you know, this wasn't a college campus and that you, you know, you, you had to be aware and yeah. have how you're, have, have everything around you. And I was, and I was, and I had no issues, but sometimes no matter how aware you are, you know, it's not enough. And certainly I know, I know women who were attacked mm. and, and of course, Jenny Kirsch, the donut dolly was murdered when I was there right before I left. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, it, 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 it was, it, it was a, um, a, an unusual situation that that you had you had to pay attention to yeah well overall i mean i know you've you've uh i forgot to mention that you were once on our board now part of our board emeritus and uh, you've worked a lot with our our wonderful educator and the educational programs here um and you have there's so many stories i I've, one of the challenges of this program is we never get to Kind of cover it, cover it all. Um, but are there any uh, uh, favorite anecdotes that you'd like to share? What was your, if there's a a best memory of your time over there, what was it? <laughs> best memory. Uh, or maybe even most telling memory. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. That would be better. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the memory that I have carried with me the whole ever, ever since and really has affected how I, I live my life was April 1970 mm. when I got a call from that engineering brigade to come and close down the library because they were all leaving. The whole brigade was leaving. Mm. So I go over and I'm shutting down the library. Um, and I said, well, where are you going? And they said, well, we're, we've got this whole convoy. We're going to Cambodia. And I thought, mm. and then as I'm watching them roll out, AFBN, the Armed Forces Radio, is broadcasting President Nixon's speech where he says, we are not invading Cambodia. Yeah. yeah. And that that just, it was like, you know, who can you believe? And this, and this is the problem with this war. 
in microcosm right there. This is why we are where we are and all of these people are dying. Yeah. So that, that has stayed with me for over 50 years. Uh, how, how far into your, uh, it certainly wasn't a, a tour uh, per se, but how long was your, were you, your assignment, were you only get, supposed to be there for a year or was there like an, an end point in sight that you had to reach? And how, how far in that trajectory were you when April 1970 rolled around? I was, we, we signed a travel agreement, a transportation agreement for one year. Uh-huh, okay. Where, okay. where if we, if whatever, for whatever reason, we did not fulfill that one year re agreement, then we were required to reimburse the government for all of our expenses. For our, you know, the airfare, everything that it costs them to bring us over there. Um, huh. So, so it was a one, it was a one year agreement, just like with the soldiers, some, some people extended, you know, a lot of people extended for six or eight months. Some of them extended for years. Yeah. Um, but but yes, there was an end point. It was the same year as the military. Okay. So I, I came in August of 69. So I was just about halfway through in April of 70. Wow. Wow. Were you looking forward to going home? Were there any apprehension about returning to the United States or? Well, I was looking forward to leaving Vietnam. <laughs> I, I, I had, you know, I, I was done. I really was done. And, and, and Jenny Kirsch's murder right in that last month just was like the fiesta is on this time. I, that, I said, I just got to get out of here. Um, you know, my whole feeling about the war and whether we should have been there and what we were doing there had just completely done a 360. You know, I when when I went, I believed the government. I believed we ought to be there. I believed the domino theory. And, you know, that was just completely upended by what I saw there. So, uh, yeah, I was ready to leave. I had... I was still trying to see as much of Asia as I could because, you know, I thought I'll never get back here. So I had booked a, a month tour to Japan. No. So I didn't go straight home. Uh -huh. I, when, I, when, I, I, when I left Vietnam, I went to Japan and on an Air America flight of all things. Oh. And... and uh, and then uh, that landed me at Yakuska Air Base. And then I took a train to Tokyo and I met up with this tour. And then I, it, it went all over Japan. I went everywhere. Um, that, it was fabulous. I went to the World's Fair in Osaka. Oh, um, so, yeah, it was, it was great. And what I didn't realize at the time was that it was giving me all that time to decompress from Vietnam. It wasn't just leave Vietnam and you're dropped back into your former life. You know, yeah. I had that time with this group of people, uh, mostly Americans, uh, even a couple from my hometown, um, who you know were not connected in any way with the with the Vietnam War or with the military. You know, they were just American tourists on a holiday. So oh. it, it really gave me a chance to really ease back in something a lot, of, a lot of people didn't have. So when I flew back, back to Travis Air Force Base, I was on a plane from Yakuza filled with Air Force wives and children. Huh. All of us in civilian clothes, completely unrecognizable as having been in Vietnam. Huh. So, the, so what happened to the people who came straight back in uniforms 
when they got off the plane and went to San Francisco airport and were accosted, I was completely transparent. Yeah. I could see soldiers just like at UCLA being attacked, you know, in the air, in the terminal. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just, Got my flight to Los Angeles and my family picked me up and we went back to Riverside and my first stop was the taco stand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even want to go home. I, I wanted to go to the taco stand. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming, returning to civilian life or or coming back from Vietnam, let's let's put it that way. Um, you know, so many of our veterans and people who had seen, experienced it firsthand, talk about sort of the, the sort of the cultural prejudice against that service, and oh, yeah. um, you know, to the point of even you know not putting it on their resumes or having trouble in job interviews or not being able to get a job at all. Um, right. Because of it, uh, how how was your service over there perceived going forward? Well, <laughs> mostly nobody knew about it because I went back to Riverside. I I um, slept for several days, yeah. and then then i started to get together with my family and with some of my friends from high school and college and of course they knew that i'd been in vietnam but boy they sure didn't want to acknowledge it <laughs> oh. uh, there was just there was just no interest in discussing how i had spent the last year it was as if you know well you're it's it just didn't happen. Now you're back and we're just not even going to pay attention to that. <laughs> and my my girlfriends from school, you know, they were married. Most of them were having babies. And, you know, I thought, I felt like I was 20 years older than them and had no connection with any of them at all. And it was clear that nobody wanted to talk about what I had done for the past year. Mm -hmm. So it, it, was, it was very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't stay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people actually went back to Vietnam, but I did not do that. I moved to New York City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I got there, um, I, I looked for a job as a librarian and I got a job in a public library on Long Island, uh, as a children's librarian. Hmm. So I, I knew not to put Vietnam on my resume. Huh. I, I put that I had worked for the army and I put what I did, but basically library work is library work. <laughs> and so I could describe what I had done without ever mentioning where I had done it. And I got this job as a children's librarian and you know, nobody looks at somebody doing story hours and playing Easy Weezy Spider a 24-year-old that they were in Vietnam four months ago. Huh. So I kept my mouth shut. And so I had no issues because nobody knew where I, was, where I had been. And nobody did for years. Yeah. How, how did it eventually kind of come, come out for you? Well, it came out um, in 1975 very briefly, because in April 75, when the North Vietnamese were advancing, I helped get the two women who had worked for me in the Cameron Library. I helped, I helped one of them and kids 
and one brother who managed to make it to Saigon. I helped them all get out. Wow. The tell, other, tell us, tell us more about that. That is well, the two, the these two women, they were sisters, and one of one of them had married a, a GI, an American, um, in seventy. I was in seventy, so the end of seventy one, early seventy two. She had married an American. So she had already come to the States and they were at Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm. And I had stayed in touch with all of the Vietnamese, with the woman that worked in the, in the Trang Library and the woman who worked at the Cameron Library. Since I, we had written letters back and forth since I'd gotten back. And things fell apart so fast that I there was nothing I could do for the woman in the train. But the other sister, she had moved to Saigon with her two kids. And and then she got her sister's son who was still in Vietnam. And they she took them to Betty Chisdale's Unlock Orphanage. Mm and surrendered them so that they would be get on on that orphanage but the uh, two of the children were amerasian and so they would could get on the orphanages flight out betty tisdale yeah. was married to a colonel at fort at fort benning and she chartered a plane to fly the the kids in her orphanage out of the country. This was separate from the, the other baby with flight. Yeah. Um, so, so that's how the three kids left. As it happened, the plane flew, was flying out at about the same time as the C-5A plane crashed. Yeah. And we were frantic because as we did not know which plane they were on. Mm. But, but that plane got to Fort Benning. It actually flew to Fort Benning. And, um, and then the other sister who was already there was able to reclaim all three of the kids, her son and her sister's children. So then it was a matter of trying to get the other family members out. And, <laughs> you know, I called my congressman in Bergen County, and I was sending telegrams. I had letters of sponsorship. I was sending telegrams who were selling, sending Twixes, which is the, <laughs> the ancestor of facts, and um, to the embassy, to them directly. And it was just chaos. The Congress was sending mail through the State Department. And, you know, Saigon fell and I had no idea what was happening. And then a few days later, I got a phone call from Guam, a collect call from Guam. And she and her brother had the letters that, that, that I had written, got them on to Tonsonuk. And they got on one of the last helicopters that took off from Thompson. Wow. So from there, they went to Indian Town Gap, and then they went to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and then to Columbus, where her sister was. And her sister sponsored all of them. Hmm. Do you still so, stay in touch with them at all? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 And then in the 80s, under the orderly departure program, brought over another sister and her two daughters. This sister had also worked for the Americans and a younger brother and his wife and their kids. Huh. Gosh, wow. Huh, it's sobering. I, I, th those, those stories are something that are very near and dear to us and that I, it, it speaks so much to this sort of enduring legacy of this war. And I don't think a lot of, I'm embarrassed to say, but I, it, 
unless you have a direct connection to that, I don't think a lot of people think of it as being an, an immigration story the way that it really is. And um, it's powerful every time to hear about it. Um, yeah, you can imagine how we all felt watching what happened in Afghanistan. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of connection. Absolutely. A, a repeat performance of the same chaos and putting things off until it was too late that we saw in 75. Yeah, terrifying. Well, Anne, how, um, so you kind of have brought us up to the 1980s, but uh, eventually you end up here. <laughs> and uh, what was your path to the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial? Oh, well, and so after 75, I shut my mouth again and did not talk about Vietnam or have any connections to Vietnam at all, which means, and that, and that was true until 1992, when I saw a brochure on my desk at County College of Morris about a, a, um, faculty interchange with fac between American faculty and faculty at the University of Hanoi and the University of Ho Chi Minh City. Huh. And I, I looked at that and I thought, I want to go back. <laughs> so thanks to the support of Cali College, because there was a, a, a a funding component that the institution had to commit to, I was able to go on that trip back to Vietnam. Huh. And it was a very big group. It was well over 30 people, all academic, from all academic institutions all over the country. And almost everybody was a Vietnam vet. Hmm. So that was when, on that trip, that was when I really started to talk about Vietnam with, and listen to the, the other vet stories. And it, it was really a fantastic opportunity. And a lot, of, a lot of closure and healing went on on that trip. And then when I came back, then I wanted to get more involved. So that was when I connected with the Vietnam Women's Memorial Project. Ah. And, and they had a sister search program where you could look for other women you had served with or that had served in the same capacity as you. So I sent a letter out looking for people from special services. And that was how I found Judy Gaudino, who lived in Summit, <laughs> and, and Kathleen Cordova, who lived in California, and then they brought me into the fold, as yeah. it were. And then I, I was really active in that last year before the Vietnam Women's Memorial was dedicated. Okay. Um, and then we all went to the dedication of the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And that was how, that was my first interaction with the New Jersey Memorial. Wow. Well, having now been uh, sort of a, one of our spokes people <laughs> for, for a number of years, um, you know, I asked this of everyone on the program, you know, if there's one thing that you hope that future generations understand about this moment in our nation's history, what do you hope that takeaway is? Um, that you have to be a responsible citizen, that mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to what is happening <laughs> around you and what people, elected officials are doing in your name. Hmm. And you have to exercise your responsibility to vote and to make, use critical thinking skills to make informed decisions yeah. about what, what is going on 
and not just blindly believe what you're told by people in charge. And it's because if you don't do that, then you, a democracy doesn't work if you don't have an educated population that is willing to take responsibility for their own government. Yeah. And that did not happen in Vietnam. And sadly, it has not happened on several occasions after Vietnam. Mm. But that's what I hope, especially young people take away, that being a citizen of a democracy is a re requires responsible proactivity on each person's part. Yeah, yeah. And on a lighter note, I also ask uh, this question <laughs> <laughs> uh, of all of our, uh, most of our participants, at least. Um, you know, it was certainly an era that was defined by a lot of things, politics and uh, pop culture and uh, music. But is there a song of the era that brings that moment in time back to you the most? And if so, what is that? Well, certainly you got to we got to get out of this place. I'm sure everybody says that. <laughs> but also war, Edwin Starr's War. Sure. sure. That came out it, right again right before I left in 1970, and that there were the army or well the cover the military what didn't want that song played on AFBN. There I can't were, imagine why. <laughs> yeah, there were there were definite efforts to to um, to censor playing sure. that record, but it it slipped through, and of course the guys who were coming in just carried it in their luggage. Mm -hmm. No, the the, rec the record the uh, the so they couldn't keep it away. But yeah, that. That is the, um, except for we got to get out of this place, which always will bring back Vietnam. Um, the war just kind of says it all. Well, Anne, um, I, we're, we're almost out of time here. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us tonight? Um, I don't know. We covered a lot of the ground there. <laughs> I, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you joining us here. Um, and uh, thank you for your service to our armed services over there during that, that such a definitive moment in our, in our past. And, uh, and thank you for your service to the foundation uh, as we've gone forward. Um, for our audience out there, um, we're going uh, next uh, vet chat will be April 21st, and we're going back up north to marine country with uh, Jim Berenger. So join us uh, for that. And um, thank you, and hope to see you again. And again, thanks, and thanks to our board and the trustees for their support of this program. And uh, Sarah Almazon of Enroute Marketing for running things uh, behind the scenes. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Bye, Anne. Thanks. Hey. Bye.